Okay, so here we are in SketchUp, and this is a fairly simple model of a flower pot that I want to UV map. So the first thing I'm going to do is uh, take this flower pot and run the uh, triangulate faces in selection plugin on it to get a uh, nice uh, triangulated poly model and then I'm going to export that as Collada to the desktop and then we're basically done with SketchUp I'm going to go into Blender and import and there's my model now just do the basic uh, post-processing. I'm going to hit A to make sure that nothing is selected and then right click on the model. Then I'm going to go down here to object mode and switch to edit mode. So now we can see the polygons. I'm going to hit A to select all. Go to remove doubles, recalculate, and the post-processing is complete. So before I go any farther, I'm going to save this file. To the desktop. Alright, a couple more quick checks here before we continue. Keep in mind, uh, if your geometry is bad, you're just wasting your time UV mapping, which is very tedious, and uh, you really don't want to waste your time. So. What I'm going to do is hit A and make sure that Vertex Select Mode is selected down here. Then go over to Select and Non-Manifold. Now, the fact that it didn't select anything is exactly what I wanted to see. If, for example, a bunch of these vertexes had lit up like this and became orange, that would be very bad. It would mean there is internal polygons inside this mesh, and that would basically mean that my geometry was no good and I'd have to go back to SketchUp and clean it up and uh, make that right so that I would actually have a good model to uh, UV map but since nothing lit up the uh, model is basically good to go so uh, keep that in mind definitely you'll wanna watch out for those non-manifold vertexes and the final step in making sure that the model is optimized for UV mapping is to check the various uh, planes of the model for example like uh, this entire ring here this is a plane this uh, circle down here this is a plane this ring here is a plane the bottom is a plane and what you're looking for specifically are areas where the polygons are uh, not optimal, uh, meaning that, for example, like this one is really narrow. Uh, you can see how all of these polygons are relatively um, wide, and then this one is incredibly narrow. That's bad because it can produce undesirable results with your UV mapping. Luckily, there's a fairly easy way to fix this. Um, you want to have the face select tool and uh, click on a face that is part of this plane and go to select link linked flat faces and uh, as you can see we have a little bit of a problem here it selected the entire bottom of the pot uh, and this can be easily controlled here with this sharpness so this is an angle if I put in 150 uh, suddenly it reduces the uh, spread and uh, you can see we have a nice tight circle selected here so now what do we do? Well, it's it's really easy. You just go to Mesh, Faces, and Fill. And you can also do Beauty Fill, but I haven't really noticed a, a significant difference between these, so I tend to use just Fill. And now, as you can see, the configuration has changed pretty dramatically. All of those ultra-narrow polygons are basically gone, and we have pretty much every polygon is approximately the same size, or at least a lot. Uh, more approximal than it, they were before. So that's kind of what you want to do on uh, all of those uh, 
contiguous areas. One thing to uh, keep in mind is that uh, fill does not really work well in curved surfaces. So, for example, if I was to fill this uh, ring around here, uh, that would that would probably give me undesirable results and could distort the geometry. So you want to try to stay limited to um, these flat uh, planes, contiguous planes. So mesh faces fill, and you can see once again we have we have better uh, polygon configuration. And these are not ideal, but they are better than those ultra thin polygons that we had before. So that's kind of a really important step that you'll definitely want to do before you start to uh, mark seams. Alright, so the geometry is good, and we're basically ready to start marking seams. And this is the tedious part of UV mapping. Naturally, it depends on the complexity of your model. But uh, essentially what marking seams means is that you'll be breaking up this uh, surface geometry into discrete zones, which uh, then will be individually textured. So now we're ready to mark seams. And this is the actual tedious part of UV mapping, at least in my opinion. And uh, there are several ways to do this. It depends on completely on your model complexity of course so uh, if I well the first thing we want to do is bring up the UV edit window because that's gonna expedite everything so you go over here to this little control box and you come down here to UV image editor and that brings up this separate window you can drag the bar over and then use the mouse wheel to zoom in on your uh, uh, UV map and uh, the first thing you want to do is uh, make sure your cursor is over here and uh, hit A to select all and then go to unwrap and you can select just regular unwrap or smart UV project and uh, then you have this uh, triangle over here right and the reason it's just a triangle is because we haven't marked any seams over here but uh, this is kind of the setup process and the first thing you want to do over here is click on this little box keep UV and edit mode mesh selection in sync so basically what that does is it syncs these two windows so if you're over here and you deselect the uh, UV map will still be visible over here but it won't be selected so as you can see they're synced now so Say for example you have a really simple model like this where it's just a few cylinders and edges that are really not going to be challenging to UV map. You might be able to get away with the uh, quick method which is hit A and go to unwrap and then select smart UV project and then you can tweak this uh, angle limit here just uh, put in 89 for the uh, maximum angle and for island margin you can put in like uh, 0.01 obviously these are going to be different based on your own personal model but uh, it's nice to just uh, put in sort of a basic configuration to give you an idea of how this works so when I hit OK it's going to automatically uh, take the geometry over here and break it up into regions based on the angle that I input and the island value is actually the distance between these uh, zones right here and uh, as you can see there's a little problem here with the sticking over the edge so you can go to UV and pack islands uh, you can also go to average island scale and then pack islands to change the configuration a bit as you can see though this is really suboptimal uh, these regions that were created automatically are not really going to work for me for texturing so this UV map is clearly not going to be useful but occasionally you can get away with using that uh, smart UV project so I just wanted to interject that because it, it may save you some time if you were doing something really simple like a cylinder and that was all you were doing then you could easily just use the smart UV project and you wouldn't even have to mark any seams. 
but that clearly didn't work for this model so I'm going to show you how to mark seams. So I'm going to start marking seams and I don't really need to see this UV uh, image window at all so I'm just going to move it over here to the edge so that I can see the model instead. Now uh, I'm going to hit A and go down here to the uh, edge select tool and click on an edge here. So as you can see this edge is selected and if I go to mark seam here uh, and then hit A it turns orange. Now that means that it is basically marked as a seam. Now if you were crazy you could basically uh, go around this edge and mark every one of these edges that you wanted to mark individually and mark them. And you could do uh, UV mapping seam marking that way. But obviously most people will not want to spend hours and hours selecting every single edge that they want to mark. They want to do this in a more automated fashion. So I'm going to clear those seams and I'm going to show you how to do that. Basically I've already shown you how to do it but you uh, probably didn't realize that this uh, face selection method could be used for this as well but I will I will explain that now. You remember earlier when we were cleaning up the geometry by selecting a face and then going to select linked flat faces um, this uh, this ring right here may be something that I want to mark as a seam. Now normally if I if I clicked mark seam it would mark all of the uh, polygons within this region. That's because the entire ring is highlighted. So how do we uh, how do we get only the edge selected? Well that's easy. You just go to select and you go to region to loop. And now what that does is it selects just the ring. So now I have this nice ring selected and you'll see over here if I go back to my UV map and I select all and I go to unwrap, unwrap. Now we actually have this ring which is a uh, specifically a uh, discrete zone now and uh, this here is actually everything else that is not has not been marked specifically as a seam and uh, so that gives you a pretty, pretty good idea of how UV mapping works in practice. The truth is though I don't really want that ring selected because it's actually uh, the top curved part of the uh, pot so I'm going to clear that seam and now what what would I do if I wanted to just uh, highlight this edge and this edge but not these two top edges well that's fairly straightforward you just uh, click on one of these faces go to select linked flat faces and uh oh we have a little bit of a problem here basically the uh, sharpness needs to be uh, raised a little so I'm going to put in 150 there 150 degrees and as you can see now we have a nice uh, discrete ring that has been highlighted so once again I'm going to go to select region to loop and then mark seam so now we actually have the uh, area that I want allocated and now for the inside similar similar process select linked flat faces once again we have this little problem so I go to 150 and now I have just the inner area selected as desired to go to region to loop mark seam and so now I have I have my uh, rim here is not is not marked so that's exactly what I wanted and yet the uh, inner and outer um, part of the ring has been clearly marked so let's see what effect that has on the UV map over here I'm going to go to A to select and then unwrap unwrap and now you can see this ring right here is this ring here and uh, one useful way to actually see what's going on here is to select a few of these faces and because it's synced with that little button down here you can actually uh, see what's going on and uh, 
this makes it very easy to determine which uh, regions over here in your UV map is actually the geometry that you're uh, working with on your model. So that's basically how to uh, get the results that you want and uh, I'm just gonna quickly finish uh, finish up the mark scene marking and uh, proceed with the uh, rest of the tutorial. Alright so I've marked all the seams that I want to mark and now I'm gonna run the UV map one more time just to get a something to start with. So now you can see I have a pretty good arrangement here of discrete zones that look like they will be fairly easy to texture. Now this is an important uh, thing to note here. There are two methods for basic unwrapping. There's angle based, which personally I don't like because I find that it distorts my geometry a little sometimes, but the advantage is that it also can deal with more complicated geometry better occasionally but not always so I almost always go to conformal and what what that does is it basically uh, takes the geometry and does sort of more of a projection based approach to creating the uh, regions over here which I find to be a little bit more technically accurate although as you can see there's kind of an issue here with this being ovular those two uh, pieces being ovular and that's because uh, it's a cone rather than a, s a straight cylinder but as I said I still find this to be a more accurate uh, method overall and it's okay to leave these two boxes checked so there's still a bit of a problem and that is that these uh, these regions here are a little bit too close together so this is basically what I do for post-processing the uh, UV map that's been generated. I go to average island scale. Keep in mind that's not always useful but uh, most of the time it is and what that does is it just takes these regions here and it, it averages them out so that uh, you have a more accurate representation of the geometry although sometimes it can really just distort the hell out of them and that's not good and uh, the the second thing is pack islands so all that does is it packs it packs these together within the bounds of the UV box and uh, this is the sort of the key thing the useful part of packing over here is that there's a margin and you can change this and uh, what that does is it is it creates space between these uh, regions and here you can see how this works it's pretty straightforward but um, you, you want enough space so that you can individually select these if you want to manipulate them further. So uh, I'm probably going to start out with a rather um, large margin just uh, because it will make it easier for me to, to tweak these uh, regions here. But before I go any further, what I want to do is address this uh, distortion here. Now you'll find that a lot of times with uh, geometry or anytime you have a cylinder or something that is that is long and uh, contiguous that wraps around that you'll have this kind of trouble so uh, the solution for that is to actually take take this uh, circular shape here and break it up by marking a vertical seam and uh, I'll show you what that does. It's pretty self-explanatory. It takes this shape and it breaks it up from a circle to an arc. And uh, since it's angle-based, it's a lot more of an arc than it should be. But even as as a conformal projection, you can see it's still it's still pretty much a pronounced arc. And uh, I don't always do this. I do this when I feel like it's absolutely necessary. Um, since this is a simple model I probably wouldn't even do this but just for the sake of the demonstration I'm going to to mark both of these so that uh, we can actually see how you deal with that kind of distortion and I'm also gonna mark this little circle on the inside because as you can see down here uh, 
that's actually not a problem and no one would even notice this but I'm just going to do it for the uh, sake of the tutorial so that you can sort of get an idea of the uh, positive side of uh, taking these regions and breaking them up further. Now the problem with this is it makes texturing a little more challenging in some cases but it can also make texturing dramatically easier like say I want to have some kind of a design that goes all the way around this pot clearly it would be uh, easier to do it uh, along the surface of this flat shape rather than one of these circles so that's kind of the uh, the reasoning behind uh, breaking up those regions and of course uh, it depends entirely on your model you may or may not want to do that so now that I have this uh, more improved uh, UV map over here I'm going to run my uh, post processing again, average island scale, and pack islands. And then I'm going to change this value to 0.01 so that I get a little more density, and that density actually allows for these areas to be larger. So this is looking fairly good, and this is uh, definitely uh, refined from the first couple of uh, projections. So that's kind of the basic idea. You just want to keep refining your UV map until uh, you get one that is going to be easy to texture and highly manageable. And I can't stress this enough. Uh, do not just impulsively decide that a UV map looks good enough because let me tell you the texturing can be a real problem and if your UV map isn't absolutely flawless you're just going to be wasting your time because you could spend a lot of time texturing and if your UV map is even a little bit out of whack it's just gonna it's gonna look horrible but uh, we'll go over go over that a little bit later in the tutorial alright so you have your basic UV map over here now and it looks pretty good right but there's still a little bit of weirdness like this little uh, segment over here is kind of off to the side and it's maybe a little bit smaller than you want so how exactly do you go about manipulating these uh, regions well it's fairly straightforward um, always make sure that you have the um, selection in sync and uh, then what you're going to want to do is uh, deselect all and make sure that your face selection mode is active and now say we want to take this little shape right here well, what we're going to want to do is go to select and border select, this first border select. And uh, then you can you can basically drag around the shape and uh, it's selected now. And then you hit G to move it. And you can hit S to scale it. And you can hit R to rotate it. So those are the three sort of essential manipulation commands. Um, an important thing to note here, if you're rotating, it's not very accurate, right? Uh, as you can see down at the bottom here, I have my rotation angle, and I want it to be exactly 90 degrees so that everything's nice and parallel. And uh, I'm having a little trouble getting 90 exactly. There's an easy solution for that. You hold down the shift key and it makes it makes that uh, rotation a little more uh, finite so that you can uh, you can basically fine tune it quite a bit more and so there you go 90 still having a little trouble with there you go 90 degrees so now that's rotated exactly 90 degrees now if you want to re um, arrange these automatically now that you've done a little bit of tweaking you can hit a key a couple times until everything's selected then go down to UVs and pack islands and the nice thing about this is that it retains your margin while all it does is move things around so that they're a little bit more um, well placed and uh, so that's that's pretty useful I use that quite a bit just keep in mind that anytime you uh, use the pack islands command it's basically gonna reset your arrangement so if you went to a lot of trouble, for example, to uh, take this uh, circle here and put
put it inside one of these other circles and maybe you had these all stacked up nicely so that you had a lot of extra space in your UV map. Basically, as soon as you hit um, pack islands, again, it's going to ruin all that, so you definitely want to watch out for that. As for further fine-tuning this UV map, uh, what I would probably do is just uh, take a couple of these circles and uh, move them into a little bit better of a position and scale them a little so that uh, they're a little bit larger. It's just uh, once again using G and S. And since this is such a simple object, I don't really need to do a lot of advanced manipulation. So uh, basically, I'm just going to take these two circles and move them into a little bit uh, better of a spot. I mean, I'm not really getting much more in terms of resolution out of these but uh, every little bit does count. And as I said before, I can never s stress enough that your UV map, once it's done, it's pretty much set in stone unless you want to completely redo it. So take as much time as you need to get it really, really good so that you can definitely feel like you're confident when you're texturing that you're not just wasting your time. So this this right now is uh, I'm gonna call this good enough for me. It's uh, it's not perfect. There's definitely more that I could do to tweak it. But as I said, this is a simple object, so there's no reason to really go above and beyond with the UV map. So the next step is exporting the UV layout. So what you want to do is uh, hit your A key and make sure everything's selected, and then go down to UV and export UV layout. And I'm going to export that to the desktop. And these are two options that I usually do. Naturally, it's up to you, depending on your own personal style for texturing. But I take the fill opacity and I set it to 1, so it's completely opaque. And uh, if this is a large object, I would set this to 2048 by 2048. But since uh, since it's not all that large, it's just a small little flower pot, I'm going to leave it at the default 1024. And uh, then I'm going to export that, and now it's basically time to go into Photoshop. Of course, I'm going to save this first, and on to the next part. Okay, so I just opened that uh, exported UV layout in Photoshop, and now I have a process here that I run through. You might find something more optimal or to your liking, but this is my basic process. I take layer 0 and the first thing I do is I duplicate that layer and then I click on layer 0 and I go to new layer and then I make sure that I have the default black and white here and I go to edit fill with uh, background color. So now I have a white background then I go up to layer 0 and using the magic wand with a zero tolerance and a contiguous and anti-alias unchecked I will click in the white space and then I will go to select inverse and then I will go to edit fill with the foreground color so that basically takes all of my texturable regions and makes them black and now I'm going to go back over here and duplicate this uh, copy and then I drag the duplicated version down to the bottom and then I take layer 0 and drag it to the top I know this seems complicated but there's actually a method to the madness and then I'm going to take the layer 0 and set the opacity to 50 and make it invisible <laughs> now lastly I'll go to the layer 0 copy and go to select modify feather and uh, if this is a large texture map, uh, 2048 by 2048, I will feather 4. If it's a small 1024 texture map, I will feather by 2. So feather that selection, then go to edit and clear, and then select deselect. Now as you can see, what I have here is basically a complete sort of kit for making a texture and modifying the texture in Photoshop and 
this uh, what you see right here on the screen is actually a really good default texture just to check and make sure that everything looks more or less good on your model when we go back into blender so I'm gonna export that and I'm gonna save to web and if at first I'm going to save it as a JPEG later on I will save it as a ping but it's just quicker when you're just doing the rough edits to save as a JPEG and uh, alright I'm gonna save that to the desktop and uh, then go back to blender and go over to here make sure everything is selected go to image open image and uh, find the image that we just exported and you can usually tell which one it is because well first of all it's a JPEG and second of all there's a little dash in between the uh, words of course if it's a single word there's no dash but anyway that's kind of beside the point open it and uh, so here's the texture map and as you can see it is overlaid or underlaid as the case may be on the UV map then you want to go over here to um, edit mode change that to object mode and then change this little uh, viewport shading to textured. So now you can actually see what the texture map looks like on your model. And uh, this is pretty self explanatory, but uh, it's also very useful. And uh, so this gives us a basic idea of how the texture will be applied to the geometry using the UV map and you can check and make sure there aren't any errors or any kind of irregularities or weirdness and uh, also the uh, sort of beneficial side effect of this basic texturing technique is that you can see um, the you basically have a, a crude yet reliable uh, shading map that uh, gives you more or less accurate shadows for the various aspects of the geometry that uh, need to be shaded. The only uh, bad side effect is this seam here which uh, we will have to remove if we uh, so desire and uh, the seam is also on the outside so that is an issue that will have to be addressed. So back in Photoshop if texturing is about anything it's all about layers and uh, I have this image right here of uh, terracotta. It's actually a really nice image, high resolution, uniform contrast, more or less. And uh, what I'm going to do is create my my baseline for my texture. So I'm going to copy this, and I'm going to paste it above layer one. And uh, obviously, it's way too large. The scale is way off. So I'm going to transform that and scale it down until I get an approximate uh, an approximate size that is going to look good with the uh, the model it looks like I'm probably enough to tile this because I'd say that that is probably about a good size right there so once I've got that scaled properly I'm going to duplicate it and drag it. Try to eliminate those seams. As you can see, that uh, meshed quite nicely. That's a sign of a good texture map. And I'm going to merge those two layers and I'm going to duplicate it again. Drag this down. I can choose to put this seam anywhere I want, so I'm going to put it right here where it's not really going to affect any of my regions. So that's basically the uh, how to make the base texture. I'm just going to merge these layers finally. And uh, so now what I have is my approximate shadow map layer on top of the uh, baseline texture. So I'm going to just do another quick save to web to see how that looks on the pot before I proceed to make sure that the uh, scaling looks good enough. So back to Blender and I'm just going to go to Image, Reload Image, reloads the texture map. 
Yeah, and uh, I'd say that's okay, and not really. The fact of the matter is the texture's too, um, I didn't scale it down enough. But that's easy enough to fix, I just have to go back and, and uh, scale it down a bit more and repeat that process, so I'm gonna do that. So now as you can see with this scaled down a little bit more, it, it looks considerably better, at least in my opinion, it looks more true to life. So I have a pretty good baseline texture. Now n the next step is going to be sort of the tricky uh, part, and that is basically to get the uh, shading and all that looking more or less realistic, because as you can see right now it's completely flat. But uh, in real life, there would probably be some uh, highlights and some general inconsistencies and uh, flaws in the uh, uniformity of the texture. And uh, so all of those need to be added via layers. So back in Photoshop again, and uh, I'm going to make a new layer above my terracotta layer and I'm going to use one of the most useful filters in Photoshop which is render clouds now as you can see this doesn't look very good and it's completely obliterated my terracotta and that's because the opacity is at 100 percent and I'd say probably out of all the um, options in uh, texture mapping opacity is one of the options that I use the most often and you can obviously customize this value to get almost any degree of you know subtle variations I like 10 percent for clouds on this particular texture I think that's a good um, subtle variation and I'm gonna just gonna check that really quick in blender and see see how that looks so already right away you can see that we've changed the uh, inherent dimensionality of the uh, pot with that one simple filter it no longer looks flat it looks uh, it looks kind of uh, more dimensional more realistic so that's just a one quick and easy way to add a little bit of uh, variance to the otherwise uniform texture with the uh, clouds and opacity and on to the next layer. I'm going to make another layer and this time I'm going to just fill it with the foreground color and then I'm going to go to filter noise. Now this is probably the second most useful uh, filter for texture mapping aside from clouds. In fact actually I probably use noise more than than I do clouds and uh, I like to keep monochromatic checked although sometimes I use color depending on the texture but for for this effect I'm just going for a bit of highlight variance so I'm going to leave monochromatic checked and Gaussian because uniform gives you a little bit too light and regular of a pattern and uh, clearly you can scale this all the way up to you know 400 percent which is is pretty extreme or you can start with something lower. I'm probably gonna do like 200 maybe because uh, what I'm going for is highlights and uh, I'm actually gonna be removing a great deal of this uh, point cloud that I'm generating. So I'm creating the noise and uh, then I'm gonna zoom in here and uh, I'm going to go to select by color range and I'm gonna select the blackest area I can find with a fuzziness of 50 and uh, that's going to select most of those uh, black pixels and then I'm going to go to edit clear and so now what we're left with are basically just the white pixels or most of them I mean some of them there's going to be some grays grays in there but mostly just the whites and uh, now there's clearly still too many and I want a much more random and less even distribution so I'm gonna go to filter and uh, maximum I'm gonna set that to one and now as you can see we have we have a nice distribution here of 
quite a few random little white specks and uh, that's exactly what I was going for and the last step of course is to change the opacity and I'm going to set that to 50 rather than 10 like we did before so uh, as you can see those white specks are still clearly visible and uh, they are definitely going to show up in the texture so once again I'm just going to do a quick save for web to see how that texture looks on my model reload image not exactly the effect I was going for but uh, it looks okay the problem is it's a little bit too light so I may dial down the opacity but that can be addressed in a variety of ways anyway I got the approximate effect I was going for which is these little white highlights accompanied by sort of a darker areas of uh, subtle uh, shadows which kind of give it more of a textural appearance the only problem is as I said it made it a little too white so I'm gonna have to tweak that alright so I'm back in Photoshop and what I'm gonna do to fix this uh, contrast issue is I'm going to use select by color range click on my uh, white dots and then I'm gonna select inverse and then I'm going to cut. So that solved my contrast issue. Unfortunately, I kind of like that effect. So what I'm going to do is create a new layer and paste what I just cut into there. And then change the opacity down to 10, maybe 20. So now I still have my white dots. And I still have a little bit of the uh, sort of effect that I liked that was an accident. So uh, a nice thing about experimenting with the filters is that sometimes you get a result that you didn't necessarily plan on but comes out looking better than you anticipated. I'm going to change the white dots to 50 because they're a little bit too bright. And uh, let's do another save for web. Check this out and make sure that it's uh, looking more like I was intending. So yeah, I'm getting closer. This is definitely shaping up here. And keep in mind, this is still just my baseline texture. And uh, uh, basically, I'm going to be building upon this as my foundation to really make the design pop. So next, I think it's about time I dealt with my uh, shadow map. And uh, what I'm going to do there is uh, duplicate it. And then I'm going to make invisible that copy. Now this is my standard procedure. I, any layer that I want to keep that may be useful later on I will copy and then make it invisible and then work on the original. So what I'm going to do to change this shadow map which is the dark outline here is uh, I'm going to go to filter and stylize and diffuse and go to darken only and uh, I'm going to diffuse that a couple times and then I'm going to go to filter noise median so this is dramatically changing the uh, look of the shadow map from was basically a hard ring to sort of a very uh, fragmented and uh, subtle ring and uh, let's just see how that looks So that's more appropriate to the uh, to the texture on the pot, but at the same time, it's a little too subtle, and uh, we've pretty much lost most of our contrast. So what I'm going to do to fix that is take this copy here, copy it again, because I still want to keep that original, and uh, take this copy here and do a Gaussian blur. Sorry, Gaussian blur, not regular blur. And just going to do like five, maybe, or two. Two. Two looks pretty good, but I think I'll go for three just to be safe. And uh, 
Then I'm gonna do a save for web again. Yeah. So I'm getting a little bit fragmented here. And uh, reload the image. So now we've we've got basically the best of both worlds. We have sort of the subtle definition of the original uh, shadow map that is giving us nice contrast. And then we also have the new fragmented definition of the uh, modification which uh, is more in line with the texture itself so um, we're really moving quite along here and this is looking better and better so uh, I think it's probably about time that I consolidate my layers a little and uh, get rid of those seams okay so first what I'm going to do is take these two shadow map layers and merge them so that's important because I basically want to get rid of the seams and uh, I don't want to have to do that on every single layer so back in blender here I'm going to go into edit mode and I'm going to use face select to select the two polygons on either side of of the first seam and uh, then I can look over here in my UV map window and see that uh, the two offending uh, shadow map lines are this line right here and this line right here so now I can go back into Photoshop and see that these this line and the one on the other side needs to be taken out so I'm going to make sure I'm on the shadow map layer and using the lasso tool I'm going to carefully select these two lines Pulling down the shift key to make sure I select them both. There are many ways to do this, but I found that this for this kind of a model and texture map, this is the fastest method. And that's selecting using the lasso, then select modify feather, and put in four there, and then making sure I'm on the uh, shadow map layer, go to clear. And uh, now, as you can see, the those two shadow map lines have basically disappeared and if I save this to web and reload here I'll make it so it's dramatic, I'll go into object mode and then reload image <laughs> so as you can see the the seam has more or less disappeared uh, there's still the problem with the fact that the texture map isn't perfectly meshing but uh, to be honest given the uh, sort of uh, varied nature of the texture and the work we're going to do later that's not even going to be visible so uh, there's still another scene so basically I have to repeat that process with the uh, the other uh, arc here which uh, I won't bore you with because it's obvious what I'm going to do so now that the seams are gone we're basically ready to progress on to the next phase of the texture mapping which is going to be further shading and highlighting uh, discrete zones to improve the uh, realism. So this is where my initial setup method really shines. If you remember we created this map copy down here and uh, basically the reason for doing that is that you can take the magic wand and uh, make sure tolerance is zero and contiguous is checked this time and if you're on this layer you can take any one of these regions and click on it and get a perfectly crisp selection that is precisely in line with the UV map which uh, makes uh, texturing these discrete zones incredibly easy for example this one right here this is the one that we're going to be darkening a little so I've selected this and uh, what I'm going to do is go up to the top yet uh, below the uh, shadow um, layer and I'm going to create a new layer and then I'm going to fill that layer with the foreground color. As you can see it's pitch black but I'm just going to take the uh, opacity and set it to like uh, probably 10, I think 10 would be good and uh, now that that is a slightly darker shade I'm also going to have to uh, take the uh, 
bottom of the pot here and make that even darker. So what I'm going to do is go into edit mode, find out which circle is my pot bottom, and it's this one right here. So back to Photoshop and then down to the bottom layer so that I can get a nice crisp selection. Then back up to layer 5, and I'm going to create another layer. I know this seems counterintuitive, but the more layers, the better in some cases and uh, I'm going to fill that and since the opacity of this layer is 10 and this is a little bit farther down I'm going to make it a little bit darker so I'm going to make it 20 and uh, so now I'm going to check that out with a save to web and see exactly what kind of effect that's creating so as you can see basically it has a more or less desired effect of darkening the inside as would be natural with the uh, shading and shadowing and uh, the bottom is a little too dark but that's easily adjusted I would say going back to Photoshop the uh, internal here should probably be about 15 and then the bottom should probably be about uh, maybe I can set that also to 15 just see how that looks if they're the same value it's uh, It'll probably look okay, given that the bottom is so, so, so close. So yeah, that's a little bit uh, truer to the uh, visually what what uh, I was going for. And uh, lastly, this little ring down here, which is this strip, and I want to make that uh, even darker. So back to the uh, selection layer, select that strip up to here and make a new layer and uh, fill it and since this is 15 I'm going to make that uh, 25 because that little circle on the bottom really has to be dark and uh, just repeated saved to webs to uh, just check and uh, make sure that this is looking good so yeah, that can that can definitely be darker. And uh, I'm probably going to make the bottom of the pot a little bit darker too, subtly though, not uh, not incredibly darker. And pretty much any any area where you would normally have a shadow cast by the uh, geometry, I'm going to uh, reduce the brightness a little using this method in order to create a uh, semi-realistic shading. Okay, so I've, I've basically gone and done the rest of the uh, hard work here in making sure that all of these tones are complementary and that the uh, shadowing is fairly realistic. So, yeah, as you can see, pretty good job. I mean, compared to the beginning, uh, this is quite a bit more realistic. And, uh,. The advantage of having every single one of these shadows on an individual layer is that you can basically just go in and change the opacity and achieve all sorts of various shadowing effects with very little effort. And then when you're finally done, if you really want to, you can merge all the layers into a single shadow for wholesale manipulation. Although I tend to just leave them layered like this so that I can go back and uh, tweak my texture to my heart's content if I so desire. So to make a long story short, I basically just uh, took my texture and made a few minor tweaks to it and then I added these three uh, rows of decorative tiles and the texture is basically done so what I'm going to do is check it one last time in Blender and this is pretty much the desired effect I was going after so this uh, project is basically a wrap and uh, I hope you found the tutorial useful and uh, good luck with your UV mapping and texturing oh wait one last thing um, I just wanted to show you this little thing it's not really particularly related to UV mapping or texturing but it's very useful nonetheless. Uh, this is the uh, solid view and as you can see there's a lot of 
angles and it's very angular uh, there's actually a thing you can do to make uh, smooth surfaces like curves and cylinders and so forth actually look smooth rather than look like crude geometry so I'm going to show you that really quick just uh, select a face select all flat faces and uh, actually I want all three of these basically any surface you want to be curved you're going to want to select so I'm going to select just this top rim here as the example and then you go to shading smooth now as you can see it had a pretty uh, dramatic effect here it went from being angular to smooth and you're probably going to want to do that on most of these surfaces and here this will be even more dramatic so yeah as you can see it's a lot more smooth so that's going to look a lot more like ceramic rather than uh, angular geometry I mean if you like the angular look you might want to just leave that alone but if not you can always go with the uh, smoothing groups that's what they're called and personally I find this uh, to be quite useful and you can be strategic with it you don't have to apply it to every surface you can apply it to just the surfaces you want in which case you can sort of customize the uh, amount of smoothness that you want and uh, keep in mind there's only one problem with smoothing groups and that's that sometimes if the geometry is really complicated you get really bad looking shadows and you can usually clean that up with a fill but it doesn't always uh, work so just keep that in mind alright the video really is over now thanks for watching